While we are all joining this event from our own location, we would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Boon people of the Southeast Kulin Nation. We would like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to all First Nations communities joining us today. Hi folks, welcome to a special Deep Sky uh, event tonight where we're hoping to try and um, potentially give you some live views of some Deep Sky objects, but uh, unfortunately the weather is uh, being a little bit tricky. <laughs> yeah, good evening, folks. <laughs> um, that, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, for those of you that uh, are joining us first time tonight, uh, Mount Bennett Observatory, we uh, run outreach programs and educational sessions we're based in the Dandenong Ranges. My name's Adam and uh, joining me tonight Neil and Neil's our uh, Director of Astrophotography. Indeed and Adam you're pretty much our Director of our show <laughs> tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah what, what we were planning on doing tonight is uh, we've got an internet connected uh, telescope and um, when the weather clears up a little bit we'll switch over to that but right now um, Neil, what are we looking at? Uh, right now, we're looking at um, the All Sky camera up at Mount Bennett Observatory, which is a, um, a fisheye lens which takes in almost the entirety of the night sky, um, points it straight up, and it updates it with a new photo every 30 seconds. And as you can see, we've got a few couple of little bits and pieces of stars poking through there, but the majority of it is cloud. However, looking at the satellite imagery, um, we might be lucky enough that. Um, if we look around here is where MBO is. You can see this band of cloud that's coming through there now. It's just past the Port Phillip Bay and just about to hit the eastern suburbs. Um, Adam is actually a bit further west of where I am or where yeah. MBO is. So yeah. south. <laughs> south. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> well, given the angle of the, the clouds coming across there, it will probably clear for you about maybe 15 minutes before it does for MBO. So... Yeah. We'll still be watching the All Sky camera, but I think um, we'll have a, a view from Adam before that fully clears up. Excellent. Um, I might just uh, flick across and share my screen. Yep. And we'll, I'll just um, talk about some of the complexities um, that a lot of folks probably aren't aware of with. Um, can you see that okay? Indeed. Uh, yeah, excellent. The um, With deep sky observa observations. Obviously, um, we've, when we're looking at deep sky objects, uh, uh, looking straight across the sky, having the objects as close to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Neil, zenith, top, mm -hmm. straight uh, up, uh, straight overhead, uh, is really important. Uh, there's less turbulence, uh, so when you're using uh, cameras and equipment, it's you're going to get a more stable image. Um, so when those deep sky objects are straight over over the head, that's that's optimal, and that's at where at the moment the uh, the galactic core is sitting. Yeah, there's uh, we'll a lot of interesting in stuff in that. Yeah, and we'll have a look at that in a second. So what do we need? We need first off, we need the weather to play nice. So how can we know that? Well, if uh, you want to jump over to cloudfreenight.com, it's a really handy resource, and you can see here we've set the time to uh, 10 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And you can see here, this is just a, um, a summary of total cloud cover. And you can flick and skip ahead by an hour in one hour increments and get an idea Adam, of what, yeah. I've got a recommendation for you. You're looking here mm -hmm. at the global model for the weather. So ah. this is a model that displays predictions of cloud cover for the entire planet at the same time. Uh, however, um, Cloud Free Night fortunately has access to some other models that are higher resolution, but they're limited to the Australian area. So as Adam's hovering at the top there, you can see the models. We're on the GFS, that's global. 
but there's also yep. access C and access G, and we can try both of those and see how different they look. All right. So you can see it's so. not only is it a much higher resolution with the detail in the clouds, but it also is showing it to be different. Um, however, that one is, it does seem to be a fairly good match for what we're actually seeing on the satellite. Yeah, so I would say we would be in under this little band. So hopefully that's going to uh, keep moving. So let's try Access G. There you go, learning something new every day. So that, that um, one's higher resolution than the GFS, but not as high resolution as the Access C. So 12, 13. That's 11 a.m. at the thing. moment there. Oh, whoops. Have I gone too far? If you click on pause, it'll take you to the most recent time. There we go. Okay, 5 p.m. Oh, sorry, 5 a.m. on the 13th. That's, what I'm, that, that's okay. what's throwing me. Yeah, skip forward 12 hours, not 24. Well, it's still saying 12. Oh, I'm hit looking pause at, to oh, go sorry. back to. Ha ha. Hit pause okay, and now skip forward 12, not 24. And that'll take you to 5 p.m. And now you can skip one hour at a time through to uh, we 10 go. p.m. I was looking at UTC. Ha <laughs> uh ha. -huh. Nope, I fell for it. <laughs> yes <laughs> excellent okay so that also sort of matches up so that's good um i was just going to um touch on the mediagram too which is quite helpful oh uh, yes um so if we flick across this next tab uh you get an idea here you can see the uh the cloud cloud cover section here and looking at the uh the total uh that should be the uh the green apple green line there and uh as you can see we're sort of in this this op opening window between nine and 12, where we should have fairly low amounts of cloud. So now what you're looking at there luck. <laughs> is the prediction for Melbourne, Victoria, but they, yeah. um, cloud free night actually has predictions for a whole bunch of different locations. And uh, Adam, yeah. you can probably select Mount Burnett to see what it's like for us. And you'll probably see that green line shift out to the right, which is showing that the clouds um, movement changes through um, because we're further east than Melbourne, that means that the clouds will shift over us a little bit later because that's the direction that the, the clouds move across um, Victoria from west to east. So yes, we are looking there. Twenty one hundred hours is nine p.m. and you can see there's a little spike there, which is what we're experiencing just about now, and we're coming out of it now. So we'll hopefully in the next uh, fifteen to twenty minutes. We'll get some clear skies, and Adam can fire up his uh, whiz bang high tech um, tele telescope. Cross your fingers, everybody. <laughs> Adam, while you've got um, a, a um, oh. Fox or a browser open there, why don't you yep. uh, load up the product page for your telescope and tell people a bit about what we're going to be looking through tonight? Yeah, I was actually going to jump into Stellarium first. All right, then, we'll do that first. Um, yep, and then we'll we'll do that. Let's so, go full screen on Stellarium for that. Is that on there now? Yep, we can see that. Thank you. Excellent. So um, while we're doing this, folks, um, jump in the comments if you've got any uh, questions or if you have any things that you might like to see tonight um, or just uh, let us know where you're tuning in from. Always uh, always interested to see where, where our members and, uh, and our followers are, are tuning in. It sounds like so, Mike is very comfortable tonight. He's in his hot spa in Altona. Ah, uh, excellent. <laughs> That's the best place to watch um, guys from. So this, uh, this program is called Stellarium. It's uh, free. You can download it online. Uh, really handy and uh, really, really useful on a computer, a laptop. Uh, they do have an application, but I find on the laptop you get a much better sense of sort of where you are and where everything is on the, uh, on the bigger screen. So you can see we've got the um, these alt azimuth uh, lines on the screen, and it's giving us degrees, and that's uh, degrees above the horizon. So down on the horizon being zero, we've got plus five degrees, 10, 15, 20, and so on. Um, where I'm based, I know that my telescope roughly will sort of reach uh, above the 20 degree line. So we can sort of start to then have a look up above that and see what's what's available to us to observe and you can see this milky uh section uh the nebulosity through through the uh the center there and that's the galactic core or the one of the spiral arms of the milky way that, that's visible to us and as we sort of swivel up overhead 
you can see that band reaching around to the left there and all of a sudden all of these deep sky objects sort of start to stick out to us and that's uh, exactly what Neil said earlier. Um, as that galactic core reaches over Zenith and you can see Zenith at the top, top there, um, you can see all these fantastic objects. So the closer they are to the top there, uh, the clearer your deep sky images and your observations are going to be. Do you want to add yeah, anything? We've got a here? special request from uh, Petra here. Uh, she's asking mm -hmm. if we can go and look at a planet at some point tonight, and I think we definitely will. We've got a couple of great ones. Jupiter and Saturn are, are up above the horizon. Uh, we'll probably do that a little bit later, but um, it's uh, as Petra says, it's a good teaser for our upcoming Night at the Observatory session, which will be... Uh, Later this month, I believe, and uh, we're going to be talking about exploring the solar system. So make sure you come back for that one uh, in a few weeks, folks. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, funny, last night we were doing some, some uh, observations and one of our young members, Jack, asked to have a look at the Beehive Cluster. I think that's uh, what he might have been referring to, Neil. Ah, and that's why I didn't turn up in my search. And we can zoom right in. And then when you're a bit closer, if you want more details, Stellarium will let you click on the target and it brings up almost everything you could imagine about, uh, about that object. So it's a very handy piece of uh, equipment for anyone wanting to start out with um, doing deep sky observations. Absolutely. Now, let's around. To... It's actually really advanced too. I use it to control my telescope. Um, when I'm doing uh, outreach with my telescope, I can connect that to Stellarium. And um, when it's pointing in the right direction, the Stellarium knows where the telescope's pointing. I can click on an object and tell the telescope to point at that object and it'll go straight to it. So that's a really great way to be able to see on a map where you're looking and then see through the telescope of what it actually looks like. Awesome. I'm just going to try and swivel while we're doing this the telescope around to an object and while that's doing that i'm going to zoom in on let's have a look at this section here so you can start to see that just the uh the power of stellarium here you can see um objects that have been professionally observed and those images have been uploaded here so it gives you some references to what you're actually searching for and the further in you scroll the more detailed some of these images will get and so that's the reason like why I have to get like a square is because that is the image superimposed upon the simulated stars there so the stars don't actually look like that they're not gathered in a square in the sky it's just the edges of the photo that has been superimposed yeah um, so some of the targets we were planning on having a look at, so the Amiga Nebula, uh, the Eagle Nebula, uh, Lagoon, there's the Trifford Nebula, and there is a whole heap of others that I had a look at today that looked interesting that I hadn't seen before. And this is the great thing about this program is you can literally just scroll around and have a bit of a look. And so you can see here the Prawn Nebula. Have you imaged that, Neil? I have not yet. No, it is on my list to do. It's a beautiful one, that's for sure. Lots of hydrogen awesome. gas in there. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have a question from Deborah Hutchings. She asks, can we see the Andromeda Galaxy and how many blue stars does it have? Um, unfortunately, the Andromeda oh. Galaxy is a Northern Hemisphere object. Uh, occasionally, uh, for a couple of months throughout the year, we can see it very, very low in the north, but um, not at the moment. And uh, even if we could, it wouldn't be a very good view of it because it, it appears so close to the horizon. As for how many blue stars it has, it would undoubtedly have tens or hundreds of millions of blue stars because they are the... Um, well, one of the, the most common types, certainly not the, the, by the most common, by far the most common would be red dwarfs. That's about half of all stars in the universe. Um, but blue giant stars are very common, particularly when the stars are young. Uh, they appear very blue in the early stages. Um, if they are of a particular mass, of a you know, very heavy top star, they produce a lot more energy and that makes them more blue. 
Um, Adam is now pointing at where a drop it is currently. And as you can see, it's about 20 or 30 degrees below our horizon, or well, about 10 to 20 degrees. Yeah. And that's, um, it was a great question. The, so Andromeda is about when you do uh, get to see it, it's about a hundred thousand light years across. So it's quite a, a large and very bright object. Um, I and think it might even be a bit bigger than that. 120 to 150. Be. Yeah. Oh, they, I may have yeah, underestimated or rounded down. <laughs> um, but if that's if that's where its location is, as you can see, it will that's where it um, will come up and, and dip over the uh, the horizon to the north. And like Neil said, when we see it, I think maybe fifteen is it about fifteen or twenty degrees, maybe maximum. It'll yeah dip over, yeah, about over that. the north over the north before it then sets again. So it's a we, it's on my bucket list. It's a challenging challenging target. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. We um, astrophotographers, we are quite picky about where we shoot objects uh, because the atmosphere gets thicker as you look lower to the horizon. You're looking through more atmosphere. Um, that means that, well, when you watch the sun go down, the closer it gets to the horizon, the dimmer it is, so you can, you can actually start to look at it only when it's very low. Don't look at it anywhere else. Uh, and it gets more red. So it's it's having a lot of the color sort of scattered from it. The same thing happens with astronomical objects. So we usually prefer to shoot things that are 30 degrees above the horizon or higher. Now, if we want to photograph the um, Andromeda galaxy, we don't have a choice. It never gets to 30 degrees from our latitude. So we have to um, bite, our, um, or bite our tongue and, you know, shoot it where it is. Uh, but uh, it's not what we prefer to do. Um, so this was one of the other targets I wanted to try if we can, um, but I don't like our chances <laughs> because it's... No, uh, it's a very faint one, that one. It is a very faint one, and you can actually see as we zoom in, you can see the path that, that it's heading and you can see that uh, as time is going on, it's starting to set. Um, yeah. So we may not be able to get to that, but the uh, the blue horse head, have you seen that one, Neil? I've actually photographed that one. It's not one that you can do visually, but I have got a photograph of it. Let awesome. me see if I can find it. That'd be great. Just loading that up and I'll do a screen share. Okay, there we go. So, um, the blue horse head is part of a, a region of the sky that is very beautiful and very colorful. Um, you can see it here. This area is the blue horse head, and hopefully you can see why it's called that. It's uh, near the star Antares, which is this one here. That's in the heart of the scorpion, Scorpius. Uh, this is a beautiful, bright, well, not bright, but big collection of nebulosity called the Rho Ophiuchi Nebula Complex named after this star here called Ro Ophiuchi. But the blue horse head, as you can see, it's quite a striking... Uh... I think uh, we may have uh, temporarily lost Neil. But that's okay. What we will do is let's jump back in to Stellarium while we wait for Neil to jump back in. And swivel around to that, uh, that area Neil was just referring to. And thankfully, the clouds are oops, starting to play nice, and we've got a nice view of Saturn. So let's swivel around to that. I'm going to zoom in. I'm back. I'm back. Touch base. <laughs> ah, here he is. Excellent. So Shall I'll I try and do that again? Did you see the video with the photo before? No, we missed it. So, and I've just uh, managed to swivel around to an object on the scope. So, if I hand over to you, I'll get yep. our scope ready, and hopefully, it doesn't crash this time. 
All right. Do we see that now? Yep. Perfect. Uh, fantastic. So here, this area here is called the blue horse head. And I'm going to just zoom in on that so you can see it as big as possible. Uh, hopefully you can see why it's called the blue horse head. That shape is quite distinctive. Uh, you can see this bright star here that makes up the eye of the horse. That is actually what is illuminating the uh, the stars, or sorry, illuminating the gas and dust in that area, making it glow blue. It's a blue star. This area out to the right here is a very beautiful, colourful part of the night sky. Uh, this is called the Ro Ofuki Nebula Complex, named for this blue star down here called Ro Ofuki. It's in the constellation of Ofuki's, the serpent bearer. Um, and this area actually is a really great demonstration of the different colours you get in the night sky and a good way for me to explain where they come from. So while Adam's getting his scope set up, I'll just give you a very brief lesson on colour in space. So when you're looking at the night sky, aside from stars, what you're often most seeing are nebulae. And nebula is just a Latin word for cloud. So these are clouds of gas and dust in space, and space is full of this stuff. Most of the time we can't see it because they're not near enough any stars to actually be illuminated by it, uh, by them. But when we do get stars and gas and dust near each other, we get some wonderful uh, objects to look at like this. So there are three main types of nebula. We have emission nebulae, reflection nebulae, and absorption nebulae. Now, it's important to note that these are all the same kinds of gas, all the same kinds of material. The only difference is how they are visible. So emission nebulae, like we can see here, that is, that is a pink nebula, okay? Pink is the color that hydrogen gas glows when it's excited by the light from a nearby star, like this bright star here. So the ultraviolet radiation, uh, mostly from this star, will be absorbed by the atoms in the gas and they won't be able to hold onto that energy for long. So they re-emit it. But because of quantum mechanics, they have to re-emit it at a very certain wavelength of light. And that wavelength in the case of hydrogen, the first level of that is pink. And so we see that pink there. It's actually, technically, it's a very, very striking deep red. Uh, and the second level of emission is a bluish color. And so when those two combine, we get this sort of pinky purple color. Over here, we have a yellow nebula, and that is not actually emitting light. It is reflecting it. So it's like shining a torch with a filter into a foggy night. The fog will turn the color of the light that you're shining into it when it reflects off it. And so that's because we've got here Antares, which is a red giant star. And so the reflection of that color is coming out as yellow. Over here, we've got Roe Ofuki and a couple of nearby stars. They're bright blue stars. And so they're illuminating the nearby areas of gas and dust to appear blue in color. Absorption nebulae, though, are clouds of gas and dust that are far enough away from stars that they don't reflect or emit, but they're thick enough and they have something behind them such that they block the light from behind and appear as a shadow. So these dark bits here that you can see where I'm pointing with my cursor, they aren't an absence of stars. They're rivers of gas and dust that are thick enough to block the light from behind, but not close enough to stars to glow or reflect the light themselves. So those are the three kinds of nebula we'll see typically in the night sky, and they are all beautifully represented here in this collection of objects that uh, astrophotographers very much enjoy to look at. Let me uh, bring us back and I will put my camera back on. Oh, Adam popped off stream for a moment. So Adam, have you got everything ready to go? We're, yeah, we're, we've got a bit of cloud, but uh, we're getting some breaks, which is good. And we've got something that we can have a look at. Um, Fantastic, so I'm excited. Let me know if you can see what I can see. I can see I can your see status, your status operator. operator. Excellent. <laughs> so, as you can see, folks, it uh, looks just like a very bright star, but with a little bit of uh, tweaking, we can drop that brightness right down. Oh, what have we got here? Yeah. 
We're starting off with a favourite. We are. We're going to go... If we're going to go anything, let's go big. <laughs> <laughs> and now, I'm noticing that I'm actually hearing an echo of myself. Is anyone else hearing that as well? I'm not. Okay, good. good. I'll just ignore it. <laughs> so as the clouds move, that's going to vary a little bit, but that's okay. Let's zoom in and have a bit closer, get a bit closer look. Is that looking a little bit better? It's definitely playing around with the clouds. Uh, it's gone, has it, from the cloud? There you go. Oh, that's beautiful. You can really see the colour there, can't you? Oh, the clouds really are coming in and out, aren't, you, aren't they? I can see your exposure settings, but the planet is changing in a different way than your exposure settings would suggest. Yeah, and I mean that's the that's the uh, the beauty of having a, a telescope like this. I mean, even though there are clouds, um, especially if you're doing something like um, maybe observing a a transit event or maybe doing an asteroid observation, it's really important that you maintain um, your focus on the target. And so even having the ability to um, manipulate the telescope and uh, focus on the object, even with a bit of cloud around, it's game changing really. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as you can see, the clouds are getting a little bit better. So let's drop this exposure down a little bit, bring the gain up. Uh, we've got a good question here from Petra. She asks, can you take pictures or record this on your end, Adam? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, there's all sorts of different um, video software and some of the um, uh, people I've been talking to, uh, Neil would probably be familiar with this technique, they use the video stream to actually record um, planet data and stack it to create sharper and um, higher quality images uh, over periods of time because video is of course many 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 photos stacked up very quickly and the software will automatically pick the best uh, of those images and create this yeah, really incredible picture um, mm. and yeah automatically I can uh, just with a few clicks, uh, save whatever it is that uh, that we're looking at. That's fantastic. And uh, I'm hearing that people are hearing an echo of my voice. Uh, sorry, folks, I've had a look at my audio settings and I, I can't see what has changed. So um, I'll just try and uh, speak less, <laughs> at least until we can figure out what's going on. Yeah, I love the colour coming through in that there. It's got a sort of a warm, orangey colour. Yeah. Right, I might pop out of the studio for a moment and then pop back in again and see if that fixes the audio issue. So I'll be right back. Okay. Now, while Neil's doing that, I might uh, give you a little bit of a tour of this, uh, this software. So what we can do is we can actually click on this button down here, Explore, and see all the different uh, objects that are currently available to us and um, and swivel around to them. So it's really handy to um, to make, you know, ob observing different, uh, whether it's galaxies or nebulas, you can see um, they've got different icons to make it nice and easy to pick out. We've got galaxies, nebulae, we've got uh, clusters, different stars and then we've got the planets grouped down here at the bottom 
Um, obviously that's not all of them, but it will automatically sort of select all the, uh, the easiest to observe objects straight at the top there. And it does and that I think I organized by date. Does... By date? Yes, so these are all the best objects that it recommends for the night. I think, well, this is the thing. I think it's currently, depends on where you're currently pointed, uh, the height yeah. of the object, so how close it is to azimuth and yep. also its mag magnitude. Um, so it does takes all of those things into account. So if we were to, for example, click on M8, the Lagoon Nebula, Let's do that give now. Us a dis a, yeah, Let's it'll give us a description. It'll show us some information about it, and we can see whereabouts it is in the sky. It's, so uh, it sounds like the um, logging out and back in again has fixed the echo, <laughs> so I'm relieved to hear that, folks. Awesome. So, yeah, while we're chatting, we should be exposing. So why don't we go over to a nebula object, and we can... Uh, Get some some data on that while we chat because uh, yep. these objects look better when you've had some time to collect light from them. They're very, very faint and you get a better image when you uh, spend some time gathering those photons and turning them into pixels. Uh, yes, Jack has a request to do the, uh, the butterfly or the summer butterfly at some point tonight. Uh, let's do that after we've done a nebula or two. Yep. So it's uh, currently doing its thing, it's spinning around. Do you want to pop up a picture of what we're actually looking through while we do that? Or uh, tell the, me the name of it and I'll look it up and get it for you. Yeah, that'd be great. So the telescope is the Unistellar EV scope. All right, I'll have that in just a second. All right. Whoa, Almost there. That. I'm. I'm going to. Uh, once, let me know once you pop that up, Neil, because I'll uh, duck out and do a quick sky check. Yep. I just need to get back into the stream tab. Uh, there it is. I've got too many browser windows open here. I'm getting a bit, a bit turned yeah. around. Okay, here we go. So this is the uh, the fancy smancy high tech telescope that we're looking through at the moment. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, Adam has got this set up in his backyard, and it has uh, a Bluetooth or a Wi-Fi uh, function built into it. So uh, and Adam's actually just running out there right now to just check on everything, and uh, he can access it wirelessly. So he plonks it down outside at the beginning of the night runs it through a, an alignment process so it knows where it's pointing and then it connects through to his phone and there is an eyepiece but it's not an optical eyepiece you're not looking at the actual photons what this eyepiece is is it's a screen so you're looking into in through that eyepiece at a screen which is displaying what the camera is catching so let's scroll down and see if we can have a, a close look at it so there's an example there with its app um some example photos that folks have taken with it. And they, there we go. You can see here, we've got uh, at the very end there, you can see that little little plus shape at the end of the, of the tube. That is the truss that holds the camera. So the light enters the tube from the front, bounces off a curved mirror at the back, back up to the front again to that center of that truss where a camera is mounted. And that camera collects the light over a period of time builds up an image and sends that through to your smartphone screen. So you can see um, the object that you're looking at it. For example, uh, this one here, Galaxy M51. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, let's see. Uh, we'll go to more about and see if that'll tell us a bit more about it. Now, we're not associated with this company at all. Uh, I'm just showing this to you to uh, demonstrate and give you an idea of what Adam is using tonight. But we don't... Uh, 
endorse it. We haven't got any sponsorship deals. And I can't say whether it's any good or not. Adam's the only one in the society who has one at the moment. So he'll be able to share with you what he thinks of it. Uh, I think he, he likes it, actually. <laughs> he's having a lot of fun with it. Um, he's still outside. So I'm just going to keep showing you a few more pictures from the, uh, the website. Um, so, yeah, there's a couple more examples. So this is them demonstrating what the difference between a visual telescope and their telescope might be like. So this object here is called a Dumbbell Nebula. It's a, uh, a planetary nebula. And this is maybe what it would look like through a, a moderately sized amateur telescope to the naked eye. Um, but because this is a camera, it can do a trick where it collects light over a longer period of time and uses that to create an image. And so that image is much brighter than anything you could see with your eye through a telescope. And so arguably, it's a better view. Of course, if you're looking through the eyepiece or your phone screen, you're looking at pixels. And pixels are never going to be as sharp or as um, realistic as what you would see with your own eye looking through optics. But then again, you don't get the color. You don't get that detail. So it, it's a, a tool for a different purpose that, uh, that complements uh, visual telescopes very nicely. And Adam has returned to us. What have you got to show us, Adam? Okay. Do you want the good news or the bad news? Oh, um, <laughs> let me see if I can bring up some, some good news here. We'll have a look at the Mount Benito All Sky <laughs> Camera. That's not looking too good. <laughs> Let's so, have a look at the bad uh, news. The satellite. Yeah, go ahead. The bad news is that... Um, I had to move the telescope because right where I had it was slightly different to where I had it yesterday. And so uh -huh. when I was pointing at, when I was pointing at, uh, I, did we just salute in the lagoon or was it Trifford? I couldn't remember. It was the lagoon. Lagoon. So when I salute a lagoon, I was actually pointing straight at the satellite dish on the roof of my house. Oh. So, <laughs> so I've just moved it. So I'm going to have to uh, reacquire its position, but... I just but. checked over the fence and we've got crystal clear skies probably about 10, 15 away. So oh, fantastic. Well, looking here at the satellite image, we can see that uh, that cloud that was coming through, it's just about to clear the eastern suburbs uh, and south of MBO. So MBO at the moment is still overcast, but Adam is looking like he's getting to the edge of this cloud and behind it, we can see here we've got a nice big gap. We should be good for at least an hour after that. So, yeah, just uh, bear with me while I um, get this realigned because uh, Jupiter was actually looking really good as well. Excellent. So, yeah, what I described earlier was uh, Adam plonks down the telescope and then he goes through an alignment process to make sure the telescope knows where it's pointing and is able to track the stars as they move throughout the night. And whenever you move the telescope, you have to do that again. So that's what Adam is doing right now. Uh, it's an automated process, but it does take a few minutes to do, and that's why I am fluffing about filling dead air to try and pass the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so I can actually elaborate on that. It's a semi-automated process, so it's not quite um, straightforward. What it really needs is a really well-known sort of cluster of stars uh, because it has a database of the night sky. The telescope figures out, uh, based off GPS, where it is, it figures out the date and time so it knows where the um, star database, the positions of the stars should be. And um, if you're not in a very populated part of the night sky, it will struggle. So it does have to rely on a little bit of user input to point towards something that's going to help it to find right. out where it is. Do you need to tread outside again then? Uh, I, sh I shouldn't <laughs> say that lightly. <laughs> Fingers um, crossed. There are no certainties when it comes to astrophotography. No, as uh, as you well know, I remember watching one of your live streams, and uh, <laughs> you're quite you're, you're, you've got a great setup because you've got a few cameras dotted about. So we were able to watch you go out. I think you would were you doing yes. some plate was it plate solving or polar alignment? Oh, I, I think I've had just about every problem you can have on live streams. So <laughs> <laughs> you name it, and I can probably point you to a stream where it happened. Yeah. Um, and earlier, um, I noticed um, on Stellarium, we had a few Starlink uh, satellites run yeah, through the yeah. frame. So it could be interesting to see uh, what happens tonight. All clear over Moorabbin. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the, uh, the sky check. 
So for Excellent. those of you who do have clear skies, um, please do, while you have them, make sure you go outside at some point. Have a look at the moon, which will be, should be low in the northwest. Have a look at Jupiter, which should be the brightest appearing star in the night sky. Have a look at Saturn, which is the next brightest star in the region of the sky that Jupiter appears. And just enjoy looking at the stars with your own eyes. Um, what we're streaming here will probably be more detailed, more colorful, have more in it, but there's nothing like seeing the night sky with your own eyes. And we always encourage people to do that as much as possible, even astrophotographers. Okay, so we're about halfway through the field detection progress. And Excellent. Yeah, as, as, as it's getting clearer, it's um, telescopes getting a little bit faster and picking things up better. So that's good news. Uh, good. Who's got snacks? I've got I've got, <laughs> going. Snacks. I haven't got any. I should have bought some. <laughs> go grab some. <laughs> Oh, no, I don't have any here. I have to go out and buy some. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yes, Venus was very bright. It's uh, at, at the moment, it's approaching its brightest, um, brightest phase. So if you're out in the early evening, look towards the west where the sun has set. About half an hour after that, you should be able to see the first star that appears will be Venus. It's actually not a star, of course. But uh, as the evening goes on, it gets very, very bright. It is by far the most bright thing in the night sky after the moon, at least at the moment it is. There are occasions where Venus is further away and Jupiter is near what we call opposition when it's directly opposite the sun from us. Um, and it will be just a bit brighter than Venus. But uh, usually Venus is the second brightest thing in the night sky. And I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Hiker. I believe that's you, Hiker, under the Mount Bennett account. Petra saw Venus. That's fantastic. Petra, folks, if you don't already know, is one of our outreach team, and she is the host of most of our NATO sessions, our Night at the Observatory session. So if you remember our wonderful host, that is Petra. Uh, Alice, you aren't alone. <laughs> Sorry, Ella. Not Ella Willis. Alice. No, it's Ella. <laughs> Ella, you aren't alone. People are frequently tricked by Venus. Um, being tricked into thinking it's a star is much better than what a lot of people get tricked into thinking it is, though. UFOs. <laughs> uh, probably 50% <laughs> of all UFO reports end up being Venus because people don't look up often enough to see it and recognize it. But when they do look up, it's so bright they think it, it can't be a star. It's brighter than any star they've ever seen. It must be a UFO. So um, good on you for knowing the difference. Uh, that music has stopped, by the way. Adam, is it on pause? Yeah, I was or? just going to say, can you send me a, uh, a link to that, uh, that bomb screen? Will do. I'll put, yep. I'll put that up and we'll get I'll some... I'll put that uh, in the private chat. Okay. I may have to duck outside because it is having a little bit of trouble just detecting the field at the moment. So Yep. Once we get that up, I'll do that. Let me just get um, – see, all these are single tracks. I will go and get a playlist for you. Oh, I've got the playlist running. I just need the – oh, you're talking about the stream, the bomb. No, I'm talking about the um, – uh, the stream the stream beat playlist for uh, relaxing music. Yeah, that's running. I've got it. I've got it going. I just uh, to share my screen to get the audio going. Oh, through, gonna, that's right. We have to do it this way, don't we? Yep. So if you could just drop that in for me. Um, have, you, have you got a link for that? Is it this you're talking about? Because we need something on the screen other than the infinite. <laughs> exactly. In, uh, other than the inception, and uh, so let me pull that off. <laughs> Oh, you took it off. <laughs> I was having fun with that. Just uh, drop that into the chat for you, Neil. All right. What are we uh, doing? Uh, bomb radar stream. Oh, you want that link? I gotcha. Yep. 
All right, a little bit of cross purposes there, but we're getting it worked out, folks. That's okay. Uh, oh, so, so it was through cloud free. Excellent. Cool. Yes. Uh, Mari um, was lucky enough to see a shooting star tonight. That's fantastic. Meteors are always impressive. Um, sometimes they can be very bright, and a lot of folks will see the same one. Uh, but often there's ones that are, or much more often, there's ones that are not as bright. And so people don't tend to notice them as much. So it's probably unlikely that anyone else would have, that was here tonight, would have seen the exact same one that Marge did. But who knows? Um, it might have been bright enough. Uh, Petra is telling us a story <laughs> uh, about um, her mum also recognizing the star. star. Uh, and now we've got the echo again. again. So it's coming from your screen. Your screen. Yeah. And Adam, you're yeah. muted now. So, yeah. so okay. the, echo the echo is coming, is coming through. through. Uh, interesting. So it's it's got something to do with the, the tab that you've got open. Uh, try, the sh button. try sharing the screen, but don't share the whole browser. Just share the cloud free night tab. Uh, we'll lose the audio then. Uh, so it's either background music or an echo. Okay. Or, 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 no or if you drop out, drop, if you drop out, drop back in. I will go in. Testing, Testing one two. Three. All right, I'm leaving and coming back again. Back that, that. That. Okay. Okay, no echo, uh, but Adam has disappeared on us. I'm guessing he's gone outside to uh, check out his scope. So I'm going to go through and look at the comments and see if there's any questions there that need answering. Um, okay, so Heike, she heard about that falling star. I'm guessing that's what you mean by falling star. Um, uh, what Adam's looking at there is, ah, uh, that's the the time lapse of the night of the the cloud cover from much earlier in the night so you can see that there was a lot of clear, clearing of the cloud throughout the night so that's great um let's see matt's often just grabs his seven 50 15 by 70 binoculars that's a great size binocular they, they give you a great view of the night sky uh, he grabs them for a quick look and you're getting for, desperate for some clear sky in tassie oh <laughs> tassie doesn't have as good skies as victoria victoria has a pretty bad sky sometimes so i've got my fingers crossed for you matt um do we both have some pictures to show i have some pictures to show but uh i'd probably rather do that when uh, adam is here so we can discuss it as a back and forth it's a bit more fun rather than just me talking to the camera alone um and I'm happy to just answer questions now for the moment. Um, let's see. Uh, lots of people saw the bright one tonight. So I guess it was a bright meteor after all. Well, in that case, those of you who saw it were very fortunate, uh, partly because of the weather, partly because meteors that bright just aren't too common. Uh, so Ella was talking about how bright Venus was. It is very easy to forget how bright it gets. Um, when Venus in the evening is gone for a while, when it's a morning star and you're not seeing it, you sort of forget just how bright it is and it can be very, very bright. Uh, the meteor is being reported from all over. Wow, well, it must have been a spectacular one. Lucky ducks for those of you who saw it. Okay, uh, it was around 6.30 p.m., really bright in the east from the Fern Tree Gully point of view. Um, meteors happen so high in the sky in the atmosphere that it was probably in the east for most of Melbourne, I would say, if not all of Melbourne. So hopefully, Julie, that uh, description will help others identify whether they saw that or not. Uh, Paul, I think that might actually be the case, what's going on here, that because... Um, Adam had his StreamYard tab open at the same time as me having StreamYard open, it might have caused some sort of feedback loop. So uh, it's good for the moment. Hopefully it doesn't return because um, 
this is because we're trying to get music playing in the background and music really does make a difference. Um, when you're not doing anything, having music there means that you don't have dead air and it's not quite as uncomfortable to listen to. Um, let's see. You've never seen a meteor before. Well, wow, it sounds like you got to see a really special one for your first. So congratulations. You are a very lucky person. Uh, my philosophy is always keep your eye on the sky, uh, especially if you're out at night. In daytime, you've got beautiful clouds and rainbows and lots of things to look at. But at night, you've got spectacular meteors. You've got satellites, planets, lots of things that you you would see uh you, you wouldn't see if you weren't looking so um to quote the old science fiction keep watching the skies who can tell me where that one comes from that's a bit of a retro sci-fi for you there if you can tell me where that comes from i'll put your comment on screen Uh, Matt got to see one on Sunday night, uh, a meteorite with a really nice tail. Wonderful. Uh, not all meteorites leave a tail. Uh, that's usually um, caused by the, uh, the meteor passing through the atmosphere so fast that it turns the gases into a plasma, which is ionized gases, strips off the electrons, um, and that makes it glow like a fluorescent tube, a uh, fluorescent light tube. And sometimes it's so hot that that glow can actually persist for quite a while. Uh, I got a meteor in a time lapse where the tail was visible in the time lapse for 15 minutes. It was that bright a meteor. It was really quite incredible. So uh, I was very fortunate to be able to capture that in camera. Uh, Keith is having absolutely beautiful clear skies at Cobden. Uh, Cobden. That's wonderful. Uh, air is very crisp. Yeah, that is a, a correlation between uh, clear skies and cool temperatures. The clouds actually act as a bit of a blanket. They reflect a lot of the infrared light that the ground is emitting back. So it keeps the air temperatures a bit higher. But when there's nothing to keep that heat in, it all just radiates straight out into space. And so we have colder nights. That's why we often get frost on our telescope equipment in the morning after a very cold, clear night. Oh, wow. It even exploded when you saw it. That is what we would call a fireball. A super bright meteorite or meteor, uh, especially if they explode, is a fireball. So you are very, very lucky to have seen that. Um, okay. It looks like Adam is back and he's playing around with things while I talk. So let's see what he has for us to show. Uh, Petra asked a good question, actually. Is it meteor season? There's not so much seasons of meteors, but there are showers, and they are parts of the Earth's orbit where we pass through that has more gas and dust in it, and that becomes a meteor shower. There is a big meteor shower at the moment called the Perseids, but that's a northern hemisphere meteor shower. So unless this was an especially bright and long-lived meteor shower, uh, meteor, um, that actually survived to through the atmosphere into the southern hemisphere, then it probably wasn't from the Perseids. However, it was very bright, so maybe it was. And Adam has got a beautiful nebula here for us. Can you tell us about what we're looking at, Adam? Uh, you are on mute, Adam. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, That's all right. So we are currently looking at the uh, the lagoon nebula and we just had a little bit more just the last tail end of the cloud and that's what you can see these these the strings all these different um different uh -huh. colors looks like a rainbow um that's actually cloud passing over over the sky even though when you go outside it may look clear that's when we talk uh, as astronomers talk about high cloud low cloud um yep middle cloud even though it looks clear you may have some up very very high in the atmosphere and that's causing this turbulence and because the sensor in the um in the telescope is so sensitive it's and you're obviously amplifying um the light that's pouring into the sensor with a big mirror it's uh enhancing that that um all that noise in the image so let's try mm. Yep. Can I um, again. request, Adam, that you turn the volume down about 30%? Ah. It's just a little bit bit much. Thank you. Perfect. 
Uh, that's looking great. Right. We might need to recenter okay. that a bit better, though. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, we've already got some fans. Uh, this object is going to get even better, folks. Uh, it it requires a little bit of time to collect the data, collect the photons, and as it does that, it will get a clearer and more contrasty image that allows us to tweak the settings a bit more in the in the, the visual side of things, the processing side, to see it in more detail. Uh, good guess, Leo Hara, but it is, that one wasn't from the thing from another world. It's around the same time that... Oh, hang on. You are correct. My mistake. It's the full title, The Thing from Another World. It was John Carpenter's re-release or... Um, reshoot of it. What do they call it? Um, what do they call it? Not a, a remake. John Carter's Reboot. remake that was called <laughs> The Thing. So, yes, uh, Keep Watching the Skies was from The Thing from Another World. Uh, the line didn't make it into John Carpenter's The Thing, though. So, well done, Lee. You picked it. So, here we go. So, the, um, the enhanced vision is in progress. That's and looking you fantastic. can see down here, collected 32 seconds of data, and this is the uh, the image we're picking up now. Only 32 and, seconds. Uh, That's amazing. Yeah. While it's gathering that, let's have a look at exactly where we're looking in the sky back in Solarium. So if we zoom out, and actually I'll zoom in a little bit more, and I'll... Oh, that's interesting. You're looking out like towards our... uh, either Carina Nebula there, so it's a bit further yeah, over I feel, I feel like our timing is uh, out a little bit because Crux is actually a bit higher in the sky at the moment for me, so that's that's interesting. That's all right. Okay, the date looks correct on your Stellarium. Yeah, that's all right. Might just be uh, a little bit of difference where I am and uh, where I've put the, um, the GPS in. So... Uh, I just got to put this comment on the screen from Ella. Uh, she wants this telescope for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it would be a, a bad idea to mention how much it costs? <laughs> or, or would that, would that oh, increase or decrease the likelihood of Ella getting it for Christmas? <laughs> I hate to say it's probably going to decrease. <laughs> then, then don't mention it, okay? <laughs> yeah, I will say Ella, nothing. I'll say do nothing. some research and, and, yeah, maybe you can, uh, I don't know, put some uh, some part-time job money towards it if you're not. Oh, you're too busy with year 12, aren't you? Uh, who knows? <laughs> you might get lucky. Someone might win the uh, the lottery. So here you go, folks. You can see uh, the Lagoon Nebula there. <clears throat> so if you were to look outside and look up and you could, uh, maybe if you've got really dark sky and you're seeing the uh, the galactic core straight over our heads, it's literally almost almost straight up. And it's right in the middle there in this, uh, in this patch of uh, clusters and nebulae. How far away has it got a distance here, Neil? There it is. I'm sorry, Ella. <laughs> 4,000 light years. I can't, it's it's about, not, uh, I can't see any of these these comments. <laughs> oh, can't you? Uh, Ella just said <laughs> no. she knows how much it costs. Adam told me when we had an event on site. <laughs> oh, dude, oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so what we're looking at is 4,000 light years away. So let's have a look and see how that's looking after three minutes. So 4,000 light years, That how long is that? It's not a time, is it? It's a distance, right? Yeah. yeah. So a light year is the distance that light will travel in one year. And that... Sorry, I thought that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> it, it, it was a rhetorical question. It was. I was just opening it up for me to answer it. Um, light will travel at around about, around about 10,000 million kilometres in one year. Okay, so... A million kilometers over a thousand times, then 10 times that. So 10 trillion kilometers in one year. One light year is 10 trillion kilometers. So the nearest star to our solar system is around about four, 45 trillion kilometers, give or take. This nebula is. 40,000 trillion kilometers away. 
It just boggles the mind. It's, it's just inconceivable. And uh, later on tonight, we're going to be looking at some objects that are a lot further away than that, even. So this is where now I've taken control on the computer and I can now tweak these settings. So let's boost the brightness a little bit and I'll decrease the background a little bit just to bring out a little bit more nebulosity. And there you go. So you can actually start to see some structure all the way stretching up up through the, uh, the top of the image there. You may notice the image will shift a little bit and that's as it's gathering data, it's going to continue to center on target as um, as the night sky is obviously moving and the telescope is mm. moving to cope with that and track it. This is actually a better image than we had of it last night. I can't believe the detail that we're getting. You can see yeah, that's fantastic. Um, dark nebulosity down here and up here. You can see these dark nebula um, pillars almost stretching out and giving this sort of 3D this sort of depth to it and you can see the um, there's bits of hydrogen uh, emission around around the edges there and some dark structure starting to appear down here I just wish it had a, a slightly larger field of view I think the field of view on this is about 30 degrees would that sound about right Neil I think 30, 30 arc little... minutes perhaps half a degree yeah yeah so it's um yeah that's coming together quite nicely so um, we had a question from Janine asking about the technical side of things. It is a bit complicated. Uh, the, mm -hmm. it, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. So you can dive into this deep or you can stay in the shallows and, and um, be perfectly satisfied with just doing camera and tripod astrophotography for the rest of your life. Um, there's too much to go into uh, in this impromptu live stream. But um, if you're an NBA member, then keep watching our members' nights, keep watching our NATO streams, and when we can get back on site, come along to events. Uh, and um, I and the other astrophotographers there are always happy to share what we know once we've got our telescopes set up and imaging, uh, because once they're taking images, we don't need to touch them. So we have some time then to talk about stuff. Yeah, that's uh, okay. Uh, Heiko oh, asks, has Adam talked about his scope at a member night? I think, I think I actually talked about it at one of the NATO events, didn't you? Um, yeah, we did a short little short presentation on some of the technical ins and outs of that. I think that was NATO 7.1 where we had our telescope special. Oh, uh, yes, and that we, one, yes. And uh, Andrew talked about some of the different, there's obviously different smart telescopes out there now, and uh, and mine is is just one of them and um yeah so we've talked about it there i have brought it up to mbo but unfortunately it was all clouded out so we didn't get to use uh -huh. it <laughs> which is uh, a little bit disappointing but um ian comments that uh, he has a new tracker running outside right now so that's very exciting ian uh, i know getting new gear is is um, a lot of fun um the, the the cliche is that whenever you get new gear it gets cloudy but um Tonight, you're in luck, so I hope you have some success. Awesome. Do we have any requests from anyone uh, watching? As to yeah, we have the uh, beehive, if you recall. The beehive. Let's see if we can do that. Make sure um, you save this image before you go away from it so we can post it to the uh, Facebook page. That's a great idea. And we may need to, um, in between, I might need to format. I've never actually had this happen before, but obviously as we're gathering this data, the data's got to yep. go somewhere and it's being stored on the telescope. So oh, really? I may need to, um, yeah, save the image, download it, and then we'll have to uh, give it a wipe. <laughs> right. Well, so it is a stunning is the... image, so you want to make sure you keep it. Absolutely. Oh, that's a little bit uh, too far in, but we can, this is the beauty of it, zoom in a little bit. <laughs> Anna makes a, uh, a fantastic comment that she once heard an astronomer make an observation about the cost of a person's telescope versus the cost of their car, and that generally the better the telescope, the worse the car. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way, fortunately, especially these days. Technology is getting cheaper and cheaper, so 
Um, I've got a, a decent telescope, which was at a good price, and a decent car, which was at a good price. So I suppose if I had a really expensive telescope, then I probably wouldn't have that decent car. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> 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 so let's save it there we go so that picture is saved um do you want to maybe um while i'm getting this next one set up have, mm. can you share stellarium and yep. um, have a look at um what show show the folks our next target and i'll prepare the next all right the next one um let me just load up my stellarium <clears throat> Oh, Ella, you're a sweetheart. Ella comments, I became a member last year straight after the first Facebook Live and it's been the best year ever. I love my MBO family. Well, we all love you too, Ella. You've been a, a wonderful uh, new member to our uh, our family and to our outreach team. And um, the time yeah. that you've been able to dedicate to MBO while also doing year 11 and year 12 has just been uh, heroic. So Mind thank blowing. you very much yeah. for what you brought. You're a uh, great STEM ambassador for some of our uh, younger members, Ella. Um, I'd almost, I mean, you're more than welcome to jump on if you want to come and have a chat with uh, Neil and myself. We'd love to, always love to include our other members. So if you're, uh, while well, you're with us. <laughs> uh, I can send you a link to join in as a guest if you want to pop on and say hello to everyone. Uh, the reason why we're uh, offering to do this with Ella rather than everyone is because um, Ella is, uh, as we said, she's outreach. a new member. Uh, she's part of our outreach team and uh, she is a fantastic communicator, especially, um, well, you'll see if, she, if we can get her on. Um, but at the moment, I'm trying to get my uh, Stellarium working. So, Adam, you'll have to take care of that for me if you could. I think we're oh, both sure. busy with things at the moment, aren't we? That's okay. Yeah, we can make uh, make many things work. That's fine. Oh, save it. I'm just trying to figure out how I turn off the horizon, which I've got set to be my house from my viewing location, um, because that covers too much of the night sky. Because I, I don't have a very good view of the sky from where I live, but it's where I live, so I don't have a choice. So I'm just trying to figure out how to turn that horizon off before I share. So you can see now we've gathered 12 minutes of data. And, um, if, and this is the great thing with this telescope. We could actually let this go for half an hour an hour maybe an hour and a half and all that would um, happen is you can see now we're getting a lot more detail around that center core uh, earlier this looked quite blown out and very bright and overexposed we're now starting to get even more finer details around the, the base there you can see some structure we're getting more definition in this uh, base of the image there around that sort of side arm um, it does jump a little bit, a little bit around because we're so so focused in on something so far away but it will actually just clear up the more and more we let it track this target and i'm just going to keep saving as we gather more data i heard somebody pop in there that uh yeah that was me uh it seems to oh, be that, that when it? i try and share something uh on my computer it likes to crash my browser. So uh, I'm not sure why that's going on, but I've got it working now. I've got Stellarium ready to go whenever you are. Go for it. All right, so I'll add that to the stream. All right, so this is the view of Stellarium from my computer at the moment. Uh, very, very much the same or very similar to what Adam had it set up. Um, the key thing to look at here is the horizon marks there. You can see, oh, you can't see my cursor. Oh, you can't see my cursor, but it's just in a different place on my screen from yours. Okay, so around the horizon here, we've got the cardinal directions. That's the compass directions. And we are going to be looking roughly in the west, but going way overhead. Um, I have currently the ecliptic uh, lines turned on but we'll turn on the altitude and azimuth lines so now we can see this is the zenith so we're now looking almost directly overhead now the object we wanted to see is called the beehive cluster so 
we go over to the search window and actually it's called the summer beehive uh search for that and doesn't find it okay let's just try beehive oh i misspelled b okay not like it's the first b word that we learn in primary school right folks <laughs> okay so there we go so the horizon's here and each of these lines is at 10 degrees so it's 10 20 30 maybe 33 degrees above the horizon that means um and it's in the northwest so hopefully that horizon is clear for um adam and if you zoom in we can see here it's a, a lovely little loose cluster of stars now it will look a lot better um through oh, i keep thinking keep forgetting my mouse is offset on my screen versus yours um this lovely little open cluster here will look better on Adam's screen, on Adam's telescope than it does here in Stellarium because Stellarium only shows stars up to a certain brightness. Um, it also just shows them as sort of glowing blobs, whereas looking at them through a telescope visually looks so much better and through a, a digital SLR or other digital camera um, will also show a lot more detail. Um, but as you can see, you need to zoom in quite a way to see that. So it's definitely binocular or telescope if you want to see this object um, or a camera with a telephoto lens. Um, let's see how far apart are these lines. These are 10 arc minutes, so a sixth of a degree between each of these lines here. So that across here is only about maybe half a degree for the middle there. These stars out here might actually also be part of that cluster. Um, so Adam, how are we going at your end? Are we uh, we got what we need? Uh, yep, we've got the image saved, and I'm just about ready to move it on over to the next target. I'm just in the process of clearing out that um, that data, and it's all looking like it should be good. Uh, unfortunately, Ella is unable to join us tonight. She's currently cool. studying. She's multitasking. That's fantastic. Typical year 12 student <laughs> skill set there. Um, but yes, uh, we'll do this again in the future and we would love to have you join us, Ella. So um, folks, keep watching our Facebook page and hopefully you'll see Ella join us soon. Uh, so okay. So have we got a target... Uh, Actually, I'll just check on Stellarium for B high mm -hmm. because I'll just plug that straight in. Yeah, B high is it uh, Southern B high, isn't it? Uh, so summer B high. Summer, summer B high. I'll be high. <laughs> and this will be for Jack. Uh, this should be fairly visible. Now it's catalog number I see is four double six five. So let's whack that in. An open cluster. A second meal. You had a second meal there for a minute, says Stuart. Um, but uh, unfortunately, it was a, it was a shadow meal. Um, he was disconnected from reality, um, which is not too far from the actual meal. But I'm connected enough that I can talk to you tonight. Okay, just going through the comments to see if there's anything new we can share. Ah, oh, we've got the um, satellite view of the, the clouds again. I oh, know that's just Adam getting stuff ready. <laughs> oh, here we go. All right, we're panning over to the summer beehive. It looks like Adam couldn't find it by the common name, but has used a catalog number, which we can see there is IC four six six five, which is a very descriptive name uh, and I reckon that's it there but as we discussed earlier the field of view of Adam's scope is relatively narrow which means it's fantastic for getting photos of things like galaxies and small nebulae um, bigger nebulae will fill the frame but when you're wanting to get broad loose star clusters um, it doesn't work quite so well because you're only going to be looking at the middle few stars and I think that's what we're seeing here. The, so the Beehive mm. cluster is definitely one that's suited for lower power magnification. 
um, like a, a powerful pair of binoculars or a, um, a, a short, a long focal length eyepiece in your telescope. Um, but we'll, we'll get an image on this because this is still uh, going to have an interesting background. So Adam, perhaps if you want to lock it in place and we'll, we'll let it run for a bit and see what we can collect. Yeah, as we've uh, gone and slewn across to that object, for some reason, it's just dropped off. So Thank you, Hyper. I'm, I'm glad you got my joke. <laughs> reacquire it. So I just need to release. And I'm just going to <clears throat> connect back up. Um, while Adam's getting this sorted out, I'll just uh, tell folks that I am often doing this myself with my telescope set up outside. Uh, unfortunately, I'm having a little bit of technical issues with my telescope. The mount has suddenly decided that it's backwards. Uh, it thinks that it is pointing in the opposite side of the, the mount. So when it's pointing, when it's sitting on the east side of the mount pointing west, it says that it's on the west side pointing east. And so when I tell it to go to an object, it goes to the exact and complete opposite side of the night sky from where it actually is supposed to go. And uh, I've been trying to figure it out for a few weeks now, and I've had a few expert friends scratching their heads over it, and I haven't figured it out yet. Um, so I'm going to have to bring my telescope inside and set it up in my office and, and try to do some troubleshooting and see if I can get it working again. Because um, as Adam has now discovered, doing this is tremendous fun, and uh, I'd love to be able to do it again for you folks so that Adam and I can be alternating in objects uh, while I'm slewing over to one object and capturing a bit of data. Adam can be showing something and vice versa. We'll take turns. Does that sound like a fun idea? Absolutely. So we've now successfully reacquired. Remind me not to hit the target button. <laughs> okay. <that's> what I <laughs> <laughs> so we want the enhanced vision and I'm going to just center on this just a little bit more so let's kick enhanced view on so what have we got we've got three sort of stars across there similar to a sort of looks like a Ryan felt almost a little bit it does almost have a look on stellarium i reckon that's the three do you reckon that's is it those no it's this three so it we're seeing three. We're currently seeing this sort the of... The northern part, or the southern part, actually, because that's upside down relative. View, yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're seeing. So that's awesome. So, Jack, I hope you're watching because there it is right there. Yeah, that looks good. Let's give it a, a couple of minutes and uh, it won't show any nebulosity because there's none in that area, but it will show more stars and I think that'll be worthwhile waiting for. Um, Ian comments that he's outside with his tracker and camera watching the stream on his phone and it's getting cold out there. Uh, Ian, thank you for your dedication <laughs> to astrophotography and to watching MBO. We really appreciate you hanging around with us, even though you could be focusing on something else or sitting inside in the warmth. Um, I know exactly what it's like. I've done that myself before. Watched the stream uh, out in the freezing cold while doing some imaging. So, um, yeah. Brotherhood, brotherhood of astrophotography. I, I get that. Really feel it. <laughs> um, while this is gathering a little bit more data um, before we save save it, I was going to say as well. Um, we should point out that uh, we don't normally do deep sky uh, sessions for members of the public. Normally, this is um, MBO has as part of our membership. We've got different um, sections uh, uh, or areas of interest within MBO. Um, so joining up as a members, um, always consider um, participating because it's um, it's these sorts of sessions you'll get, you'll get access to. We have a whole team of um, people that are dedicated for deep sky um, observing. We've got astrophotography, astro arts, uh, the radio astronomy group. Um, we've got our, obviously our Friday night um, members' nights, and then sometimes, uh, if we're able to get up to the observatory at some point, uh, we would normally have maybe a guest speaker on a on a Friday night, and then we would go out and we would do uh, some observations with with all the various telescopes and kit that we've got up at MBO. So mm. 
Yeah, definitely. If you're uh, if you're thinking you're enjoying this and you'd like to see more, definitely think about um, signing up as a as a member with MBO. Absolutely. And I'll put that link to do that on the screen in just a moment. But Heike brings up an excellent point here. And not all brothers here, lots of women. That is absolutely true. And I didn't mean to uh, exclude women when I was talking about the brotherhood. Uh, the reason I said that was because Adam, myself and Ian are, are all guys. And that was what I was talking about at the moment. But you are right. I don't want to exclude anyone. We already have a number of fantastic, talented um, astrophotographers who are women at MBO, and we always want to welcome more people who want to do astrophotography, whatever their gender. And that is a key part of MBO's mission and our um, our goal in existence is to bring astronomy and astrophotography to the whole community. Absolutely. Ethos, if you will. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, and I hit the wrong button again. <laughs> That's all right. I think we've, uh, we've seen a, we a good a, view of this one now, perhaps. We have, yeah. Why don't we go on to the, so, the Trifford? Yep. Or do you I'm have something else to, you want um, to do first? No, I'm just going to uh, recenter on this. Let's reacquire and get moving. What are... Uh, I think it was Ian that's out there uh, in the cold. What What's he targeting? If um, we might be able to sync over and uh, yeah, get, get a, a stereo of image well. of it from two different perspectives. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're synced up, ready to go. Maybe while we're waiting, uh, let's spin around and... We are pretty uh, – are we close to Trifford, Neil, or should we maybe try um, – You're probably about 20 going? degrees from the Trifford, so it shouldn't take you too long to get there. Cool. Let's do that. Um, we've had a, a request potentially for yeah. the Bug Nebula, okay. NGC 6302. I will check that out in a moment. Um, Heike is putting out the call for the women in astronomy who are watching here tonight, the women audience members, to put up your hands – uh, we have Ella putting up her hand and Petra as well. Um, Kerry and Lee, welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to have you all here and um, we want you all to, uh, to get as much out of the stream as possible and as much out of NBO if you are members as possible as well. Uh, thank you for joining us all. Yeah, And thank you very much, much Tr Tracy, for your comment as well. Yeah, anyone that's sticking around. It's the, um, that's the thing with deep sky um, observations. We, we tend to um, have to let it get a little bit later to be able to um, reach, uh, reach whatever targets we're, we're looking for. And fortunately, we're almost there. Here we go. I'm just looking up the bug this. nebula. Okay, so that is a planetary there. nebula, and it's quite small, but it is in the right area, and um, it it will be worth having a look at to compare it to some of the other things we're going to see tonight. So you can see the, the big stuff and the small stuff as well. So um, maybe after we've had a look at where Adam's going now, we can return to have a look at the bug nebula. We can definitely do that. Um the EV scope's pretty capable when it comes to um, to planetary nebulas. It's pretty surprising, but let's um, let's give this a go. We've so got lots of uh, amazing women putting their hands up in the in the chat. So uh, I think that's fantastic. It's always great to let women know that there are a lot of other women along there with them. Because in astronomy, at least, it seems to be that uh, the default in the past, at least, has been expecting people to be male uh and that is certainly not the case and definitely not the case at mbo so thank you for all you amazing women for putting your hand up it's uh wonderful to see the representation legends awesome so ian has commented um talking about his setup uh, he's only just yeah. getting started and he's using a star adventure tracker uh, which i have one of those they're fantastic nice and he's shooting with a nikon d750 with a 200 millimeter lens 
currently aimed at the lagoon and Trifford. So we are indeed shooting the same object right now. That's cool. Thanks, Ian. That's, uh, there you go. So tell us about this object we're looking at now, Adam. Um, so I can click this button and there we go. So you can see there, Trifford is uh, the Messier 20. That's the M20. Uh, you might have seen in the uh, the pre-roll at the start, uh, the Messier catalog. Um, was a, Messier was a French astronomer in the mid 1700s who cataloged many, many different objects, um, including a lot of these deep sky objects. And, and um, why and did he helped... create that catalog? Why did he get all that effort? Do you know? Okay, I can. I've heard the story, but I've forgotten it. It's a great yeah. story, so go for it. Yeah, it, it, it's a, a, bit, a bit ironic and kind of amusing. Um, Charles Messier was a comet hunter. He was always wanting to find the newest comets because comets are, are transient events. They come and they go. So um, a lot of astronomers find them particularly enticing because there's always something new when you look at them. Um, the problem was with the technology that he was using at the time, this was in the 1800s, I believe, even perhaps 1700s, um, the telescopes weren't really, uh, well, they were far better than what we as amateurs can use today. And it was hard often to tell the difference between a faint fuzzy galaxy or nebula and a comet. And Charles was getting so fed up of thinking, oh, have I found something new? And then realizing, oh, no, I saw that a month ago. Um, he actually started to keep a list. <coughs> pardon me. He started to keep a list of things that are not comets. Now, by the same token, because his equipment, very early equipment, wasn't fantastic, the things that he saw as not comets frequently were some of the brightest, interesting, non-stellar objects in the night sky. And so what he ended up creating was a really fantastic collection of beautiful, bright objects that are not comets. <laughs> so in his attempts to make a list of things that he didn't want to see, he made a great list of stuff that we all as astrophotographers and uh, astronomers want to see now. I mean, there's a few weird ones in there, like a double star. I don't know why he thought that looked like a comet. Uh, lots and lots of globular clusters because they do look like comets. Um, but some of the most beautiful nebulae in the night sky all have Messier numbers. There you go. I thought, uh, I, I had a feeling there was something, another interesting story about um, the way his catalogue was actually accepted by his colleagues at the time and there was a bit of controversy, but maybe I'm thinking of somebody else, but um, that, that was really that, interesting. That may be the case, but I'm not familiar with that particular story. Yeah. So as you can see, yeah, it's um this this part here is a reflection nebula, and the reason that looks blue is because it's picking up the uh, the light of this star, and hence the name reflection. It's reflecting the um, the uh, the light from that star. The um, this hydrogen emission nebula, you can see, it's quite distinct because it's got this dark nebulosity that runs through the center and presents as a, a nice structure, which as uh, as we're getting more data will look clearer and clearer and clearer and um yeah the two of them together i think in this this sort of open cluster there's about three thousand stars so mm. um if you've got a nice uh a good camera with a, a wider field of view you can actually because of the i think the proximity to lagoon capture the two of them at the same time is that right neil that is correct they are quite close to each other in fact um, if I can just pop back over to Stellarium, we'll zoom out. Yeah. Uh, I need to zoom out on Stellarium, not on the actual stream screen. <laughs> so I've over here, yeah. we're, we're looking oh, at the it? Trifford Nebula. So this is the Trifford Nebula here, which you should be able to recognize from what Adam is looking at. And if we just zoom out just a little bit, right next door is the Lagoon Nebula. And that's where we started tonight. That was the first object that we looked at. And uh, in this case here, each of these grids is uh, a sixth of a degree across. So between the cores of these two items here, these two objects, is less than one and a half degrees. So they will fit inside the field of view of most telescopes um, with low power settings. Um, all digital SLR telephoto lenses will show both of these objects in the same field of view. 
So um, that's a, a particularly rich part of the night sky. There's actually even another area over here, which is less frequently photographed, um, but I do intend to get a, copy, a photo of this myself someday because there's an amazing, beautiful sort of river of dark nebulosity running right through the middle of that. And I reckon that'd make for an, an interesting photo. So the Lagoon Nebula, the Triffid Nebula, and uh, this area over here, all together, uh, a very beautiful part of the night sky, and they are right near the heart of the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a very dense, interesting, and beautiful part of the night sky there. Yeah, we're definitely picking up some of that blue color there from that uh, reflection nebula nearby, aren't we? Yep, and it's going to get a little bit, uh, a little bit brighter as I've tweaked some of the settings yep. just to bring out a little bit more detail. And appropriately, as we're doing this, talking about the uh, the equipment that you're using, Anastasia uh, has just joined the stream and she's asking, "What telescope and camera do you use?" So I'll let a a yep. Adam answer that, but I will just say we're not using a telescope and a camera; we're using a telescope camera. I'll let Adam explain. <laughs> well, thanks for joining the stream, Anastasia. Good question. It's uh, so the equipment we're using. It's a um, a telescope called an EV scope, which stands for, as you can see down here, enhanced vision. Um, the reason it's called that is because, uh, like Neil said, it's essentially a um, a really fancy camera. It's a telescope barrel. Um, it's a Newtonian reflector setup, so it's got a a primary mirror at the at the base but where you would normally have a secondary mirror there is actually a camera sensor placed there so all the photons all the light that is hitting the mirror is being bounced up to the sensor and processed and in a, a bit of a fancy way the software calculates um, where the object is and it keeps it centered and you may have heard of a process in astrophotography called stacking and essentially that's kind of what it's doing um, the cool thing about this telescope is it does have an eyepiece um, the eyepiece that you look through is a mini um, OLED display you really couldn't even tell uh, the difference or like that it was a screen that you were looking at that's the, the amount of clarity believe it or not you actually get more color and clarity than what we're seeing here on on the screen um i've That's currently amazing. got this connected got the yeah it's i've got this connected by the the wi-fi i'm indoors my telescope is outdoors it's all wi-fi um the telescope uh, battery i think is capable up to about eight hours so you can definitely get through a, uh, a full nighttime session of observations That's and, fantastic. Um, yeah, and that's and the and the point of that is like we talked about a little bit earlier is the citizen science campaign. So while that's still gathering data, I can actually show you some of those things. So if we click on this uh, little uh, hat down the bottom there, we can see some of the uh, the features that, that the telescope has. Um, so asteroid occultations. We've got exoplanet transits. What's an asteroid occultation? Is that to do with uh, contacting the dead and burning incense? <laughs> or is it a well, different kind of occult? We, well, <laughs> we, we, we've done this before. Uh, so for those that, that don't know what an asteroid occultation is, um, that is... Uh, oh, you're, you're testing my memory now, Neil, but it's basically <laughs> where where the uh, asteroid passes in front of a, a very bright star. and Not even necessarily a very to... bright one. It can be faint ones as well. Oh, there you go. Okay, cool. So it passes in front of a star and with the equipment, we're able to monitor and watch the star brightness decrease and dip. And basically based off that dip, we're able to get more accurate data as to the size, the position, the speed the asteroid is traveling. And the more of these tel smart telescopes we have dotted around the Earth at certain points, all focusing on the one target, we're able to gather lots more data and based off those positions more accurate data and create 3d models from it is that, is that it's really right? cool it, no right it's perfect <laughs> and it's a way that um, citizens can get involved in real science because the shadows of these asteroids from the star only pass over a very small streep stripe of the of the earth and so um 
getting telescopes across the entire width of that shadow means that you can get a lot more information about the shape of the asteroid. And of course, there are not professional telescopes covering the entire Earth. So amateurs are in the position where they can take their telescopes to these different locations and coordinate with each other so that they can get more data. And it's something that professionals just can't do. Even the way telescopes are going now with uh, the huge um, uh, survey telescopes coming online, which will be able to find comets and supernovae and all sorts of stuff that was previously um, available to amateurs. Um, doing occultations is something that will not be possible with professional equipment for a very long time, um, simply because there's not enough of them and they don't cover enough of the night sky. Uh, I also just want to pop on screen uh, a hello from Belinda. Belinda's a good personal friend of mine. Lovely to see you here, Belinda. Hey, thank Belinda. You for coming. So, and also, thank you yeah, everyone so for laughing at my lame occultation joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so that's just uh, some of the citizen science uh, capabilities of, of the telescope there. So, um, yeah, having these these devices that can track um, some of those events that require long duration. Um, observations is really handy mm. we just had a, a comment think? from stuart who is one of our experts um he says that occultation is better at determining position distance and the size of objects than professional telescopes there you go thanks Stu. legend he is indeed uh one day we'll be calling him dr Stu because he's working We're on sure his will. uh cosmology phd and he told us last night that he has uh, just completed a first draft of his first scientific paper. So soon he will be a published astronomer, which is very exciting. So do we want so, to uh, save this and move on to another target? Already saved, so let's do it. Fantastic. All right, the request we had was for the Bug Nebula, and that was... Um, oh, it's not saved in my history. It was 63... NGC 630 okay. something. So if I just type in Bug Nebula, there we go. That'll hopefully find it, yeah. Have you got it? We're already on the way. Oh, excellent. I was going to search for it in Stellarium, but you've already beat me to it. That's great. <laughs> We're making a good team. Uh, Belinda just waved at her TV and gave herself a face palm. It's been a long day. Belinda, I wave at my TV as well, so feel free to. Everyone wave at the TV right now. I can't see it, but I can imagine it. <laughs> go on, you two, Adam. Give everyone a wave. <laughs> all righty so uh that's not right is anastasia is very impressed with your telescope and she's keen to know what on earth is planet defense about ah that's a uh that's a very good one good question uh i'm just i'll swivel around sorry if i'm just Am I doing something wrong? Should I, I should just be able to double click on bug and it should just take it straight to, there we go. Sorry. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at next, Bug Nebula. Um, so the planetary defense for the EV scopes uh, is basically uh, exactly as it sort of sounds. Um, so you're in the planetary the, defense force, are you? That's exciting. So, something Jim, like that. Where's um, your uniform? So, <laughs> So, obviously, there are many um, asteroids and objects around the Earth that are what are called NEOs, which are near-Earth objects, and they are the the, um, the asteroids that we only the ones that we know about um, that could be classed as potentially hazardous. So it's really important that we have accurate um, data, location. Um, size, speeds, uh, like um, Stuart said earlier, at the, um, the capability and the, the need to monitor those um, cons consistently and frequently. Um, a lot of the big professional telescopes, their time is being just like what we're doing now. They're focusing on an object and they may need to track that for days or hours to gather the valuable scientific data that they need for those research projects. And so it leaves a very small portion of other professional telescopes around the world to do that planetary defense and check on those asteroids. So having the capability with these, these uh, telescopes that we've got um, sort of just solidifies and builds on our existing knowledge. 
and it also opens up the possibility of um, monitoring um, other uh, potentially hazardous asteroids that we don't know about. So hopefully that answers uh, your question. Yeah, that's exciting. It's um, one of the very few things that can actually destroy the world. I mean, climate change, definitely one of those things. Asteroid impacts is one of the few things that can. I mean, people worry about the zombie apocalypse or a black hole passing through the Earth. Those things aren't going to happen. But an asteroid impact, it will happen. It's just a matter of when. And if we're unlucky enough to be around when it does, and hopefully we'll be able to be prepared to do something about it because uh, the potential is huge. I mean, the dinosaurs were likely wiped out in part because of a, an asteroid impact. So we want to know where the dangerous ones are and, and when they're going to get near us. And uh, part of that project is requiring a lot of data and a lot of observations. And that's why um, having people who use the EV scope around the world can help out. And that means getting a lot more eyes on the night sky for these dangerous objects. Um, I got a comment I want to put on screen. Uh, PJ Oldies commented that one of our members, I think uh, PJ is from the Tasmanian Astronomical Society, if I remember correctly, uh, one of our members captured the shadows of three of the moons of Jupiter on the planet while it was in opposition. That's unusual. Uh, it's it's fairly common to see a, a shadow of one of the Jupiter's moons on its surface. It's less common to see two, far less common to see three. So that's a great capture. Well done. Um, Denise asks, is there in the next couple of days an eclipse or two of Jupiter's moons? Um when you say eclipse, uh, it depends on what you mean. The moons of Jupiter are eclipsed by Jupiter every night. Um, four of them, uh, the most obvious ones, the Galilean moons, they pass around behind and in front. Io every day, um, some of the other ones a little bit less often. Um, they can eclipse each other. And in fact, that happened last night. Adam got a photograph of, of a nearby eclipse. Maybe you can show us a little bit later on, Adam. Um mm -hmm. And if you mean the shadows of the planet, of the, the moons being cast on the surface of Jupiter, uh, as PJ just told us, um, he, he one of his members got a photograph of that happening three times at, this, at once. So that definitely happens uh, frequently. And if you want to know when, um, you can download Stellarium and that will show you um, the accurate movement of Jupiter's moon so you can see when that's going to happen next. Um, Ian has also commented that he's now back inside in the warmth because it's five degrees <laughs> outside, so I do not blame you. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think when the moon's pass in front of the the surface of something like Jupiter between the, you know, with the sun behind and it's casting that shadow, uh, that's referred to as a trend. Is it a transit? Transit is transit when the moon passes the in front of the disk. Yes. And I think yeah, an eclipse so is when the that, moon passes in the last, shadow. Yeah, so I think that's what um, the gentleman from Tassie was saying was last night they transited across the front. You're welcome, Denise. Um, Robert comments, uh, I believe it was Robert who requested the bug, the bug nebula. Uh, he says it's looking good. Uh, as you can see, it is a, a very small object in the sky, especially when we compared it with... Um, the Trifid Nebula, which we just looked at about a moment ago, and the Lagoon, which we looked at the start of the night. The Lagoon, we couldn't even fit in the field of view, but this is zoomed in on the Bug Nebula. But it's got a very interesting structure, hasn't it? Yeah, I'm just going to try and tweak and see if I can get some more um, out of it because that core is very, very bright. It is, isn't it? We'll see. Uh, for long-time viewers, you may recognize this fellow. <laughs> Aki is still around and he's still as hungry uh -huh. and as pestering as always. But uh, Hi, I thought Aki. you might like to say hello to him as you walked past. So Stuart's got a great question and I'm going to put you on the spot, Adam. What type uh -huh. of object is the bug nebula? Uh, planetary nebula? Correct. It is a planetary nebula. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to explain that or shall I take it for you? Go for it. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm focusing on, uh, on, on getting, getting the, the best image, image yeah. we can. Absolutely. Um, well, to start off with, planetary nebulas or nebulae aren't planets. So they're misnamed. Again, this was back in the days when they had poor telescopes. Um, some of the first planetary neb nebulae discovered they looked to the eyes of the astronomers at the time a bit like planets. They knew they weren't planets, 
but they said these things, don't know what they are, they look vaguely like planets, at least the brightest ones that they first saw did. Um, but what a planetary nebula actually is, is the remains of a dead star that was lighter than eight solar masses or thereabouts. So any star which has more than eight solar masses or thereabouts, when it dies, it will explode in a supernova. And that'll leave behind a supernova remnant, which is a type of nebula, but a different type. Uh, planetary nebula is what happens when the star which is going to die um, starts running out of um, hydrogen and helium to turn into energy. So it converts hydrogen to helium and then helium it, it starts converting to other heavier elements. When it gets to that stage, there's a tug of war between pressure from the, uh, the gravity of the, uh, the star pulling the gases in and expansion from the heat of the, the, the huge nuclear reactions going on. And it becomes more unstable as it gets older and that sort of bounces in and out. And it does that eventually on a huge scale. The, the star becomes a, a red giant star. And red giants, they, aren't, they are stars, but they're not as you uh, imagine stars. They're, they're very, um, the outer edges of them at least are very thin, very um in lots of motion they say so they bubble and broil and turn around and occasionally a star will burp it will push out a whole bunch of its outer atmosphere um, as it goes through these unstable changes and when it's pushing that out the the quantity of the gases and dust that are blown out are huge and they expand away from this the dying star and these stars go through cycles of doing this and they push out rings and lumps and different shapes of gas and dust. And over time, that grows and grows and grows and the star starts to lose mass. Eventually, that star will puff away the entirety of its atmosphere and what will be left behind is just the hot core of the star, um, a white dwarf. So the star is essentially dead at that point. The white dwarf is not undergoing nuclear fusion. It's just glowing from the heat of the leftover reaction. And that star, that white, heart, that white hot core in the center of the dead star, illuminates all the gas and dust that used to be in the star's atmosphere and was puffed out, blown away over millions of years prior to its death. And so these stars, <clears throat> these nebulae are usually circular or spherical or definitely um, symmetrical in shape. Some of them, like the bug nebula here, they are less circular, but they are still symmetrical. Um, the reason for this being the case is there's a variety of different reasons. Often it's the case that there's a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field, that when the atmosphere is puffed out, the gases are often ionized, they're charged, and so they follow those magnetic field lines and get ejected out towards the north and south poles. Um, less matter goes out around the equator, and so you get a, a symmetrical tube of sorts. Uh, and that, I believe, is what the case is with the bug nebula. Um, our resident expert, Stuart, can probably confirm or elaborate on that. Um, but that's the basics of, of planetary nebulae. They, they form these symmetrical, circular or linear shapes um, as a result of the atmospheres of dying stars being ejected over time in the last several million years of its life. I'm so glad I handballed that to you because you're explaining it far <laughs> better than I would have. <laughs> so, Stuart, you asked the question. I hope that answers it for you. Uh, we've got a few people recognising Arky and, and being happy to see him again. <laughs> uh, Arky and I miss you too, Belinda. It's been a tough while. Um, so, yes, that is how we spell Aki. Um, it's a Japanese name. It means autumn. And uh, when I got him, it was autumn. So that was part of the inspiration. Um, Heike says, Aki is the unofficial NBO mascot. I, I think that would be correct. Yes, that's that's one way to put it. Uh, everyone's putting their cat emojis in the chat, which I love. I love seeing that whenever a cat comes <laughs> up on stream. Um, Stuart we, uh... gave a bit more detail on my answer. He says, sometimes... Slightly larger stars than what Neil's talking about form neutron stars. Larger ones form black holes. And even larger ones le uh, leave any... Okay, I think Stuart might have missed a word there. But even larger ones leave hardly any remnant behind at all. 
Um, but it seems that Stuart was satisfied with my answer. He says, thanks, Neil, and blows me a kiss. Thank you, Stuart. Very kind of you. There's one back. <laughs> So we, uh, I think we're pretty, pretty right with that one. We could definitely work on the uh, on the data for hours and hours on end, but yes. uh, we've been we've been going a while. I'm conscious of that, so I'd love to maybe swivel around to a galaxy. That's a great idea. I'd love to see a galaxy before we finish up. One. We've got uh, seven minutes until we've been going for two hours, so let's roughly aim to make a two-hour stream so we'll finish up on this last object which will be a galaxy do you have one in mind adam i'm just going to have a look and see what we've got available um i'm sort of thinking the one that's a little bit low bella Have has just commented that her kitties morris goose and cookie say hi back that's awesome i actually have a good friend who has a cat called cookie it's a fantastic name for a cat Kerry's excited that we're going to have a look at a galaxy. Galaxies are always uh, impressive to see. Yep, I think the um, spiral that we had a look at yeah, last night right, was a really, really nice view. Oh, that one, yes, um, the one you showed me earlier. Yeah, and it's in a good position of the sky, so let's go. The M83 is just sitting now, so that's not an option. So I love watching the video stream when uh, you pan across the sky. You see the, the stars streak ah. dramatically and quickly across the screen. It's like light speed. <laughs> Millennium Falcon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Stuart provided a little bit more detail. Large stars don't form a stellar remnant because they explode so large that there's nothing left. Wow. That's amazing. So I'd imagine that means that the vast majority of the matter in them is converted into energy, which just boggles the mind uh, that how much energy that would be. That would be something that would register on um, the gravity uh, gravity wave detectors, I'd imagine. Um, Adam and Neil, how's the butterfly coming along? Petra, we had a look at that a little earlier tonight. Um, you might have been uh, away from the computer for that brief period, but um, we did get a look at the uh, the butterfly cluster. Um, I think Adam has been saving all the images as he goes, so we will post those, or he will post those, to the uh, Facebook page uh, at some point uh, in the next day or two, I would imagine. Yep. Um, uh, so for those of you who are watching on Facebook, PJ Oldies has um, put a link in the chat to the photos uh, of shadows on Jupiter. So um, you can't click that, click, click that in the video, of course. But uh, if you're in Facebook and you're on chat, you can click on the chat. Just fair warning, I haven't checked the link, so I can't confirm or deny that it's a safe link. But uh, I don't see any reason to, to think that PJ is not trying to be straight with us. I'd love to check that out at some point. That's at 67 uh, degrees at the moment. The Saturn Nebula. Yeah. That's another planetary nebula. You can see that the sort of the spherical shells being pushed off that there. Um, yeah. It's called the Saturn Nebula because it looks a bit like that, but it looks a bit like Saturn, but also because it's very, very small in the sky like Saturn. Yep. Uh, Kelly just said that she saw the link, to... and it was amazing. Okay. Uh, thank you, so Denise. Uh, Denise has thanked us both, Adam, for a great night. Thanks, Denise. No worries. Okay. So let's turn on our enhanced vision and see if we can see 6907. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping this... Uh, there it is, down the bottom there. There it is. So I'll just turn that off. I'll recenter. Is that purring coming through on the microphone? <laughs> it is. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. Stuart has clarified saying, by stellar remnant, I mean what's left of the core. Most of the mass will form a supernova remnant or maybe hypernova in this case, like usual. Supernova remnants are 
also very spectacular objects to look at. Uh, we didn't go one of those tonight, but we've got to leave something for the future. Would that be something like maybe uh, the Helix or Dumbbell? No, the Helix and Dumbbell are both planetary nebulae. Planetary, um, yep. Yep, uh, supernova in that, uh, things like uh, the Vela Nebula, um, Pencil Nebula. Um, oh, can't think of anything else right off the top of my head. Oh, the Crab Nebula. Uh, that's a very young supernova remnant. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait for you to get your, uh, your equipment. My gear, uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Working. <laughs> All right, so folks, what we're looking at here is a very faint galaxy, but give it a little bit of time and you'll start to see it come out and you'll see a lot more detail and structure. Well, I say a lot more. It's not going to be Hubble, <laughs> but you'll definitely see um, some spiral arms come into view. Yeah. I'm just going to look up a bit of information on this object because uh, I want to see how far away it is. Yeah, it's, um, I couldn't actually even find it in Stellarium. Unless I was I'm using an application on my phone called um, Sky Safari Pro, and I paid uh, extra money for the larger catalog, so it has a lot more items in there. Um, gotcha. So the object we're looking at is called NGC 6907. It doesn't have a common name because it's such a faint galaxy. Um, for those who understand the terms, the visual magnitude is 11.2, so it's quite a faint object, and it's only 3.3 .3 by 2.7 arc minutes. So a degree is about as much as you can cover with your thumb when you put it at arm's length at the night sky, or two times the diameter of the moon. That's one degree. And a degree is divided into 60 arc minutes. So we're looking here at something that is around about a 20th of the diameter of the moon. So quite small, um, and it's at a distance. Remember before we were looking at uh, 4,000 light years away was the um, Lagoon Nebula? Well, this one is at 140 million light years. So 140,000 thousand light years. That is a long, long way. And remember each light year is around about um, 40 trillion kilometers, 40,000 million, no, 40, 40 million million kilometers. I said 1,000 million before, but that's a billion. It's 40 million million kilometers away. So this is a very, very distant object, which is why it's also very faint and very small in the field of view. And it's an interesting object as well. Um, we were talking about this earlier. Um, if I can, I'll try and get some, a little bit better image so that we can zoom in so let me just pop the brightness up a little bit um there's a bit of discussion going on in chat um raised first by um belinda uh, about sci vr um i uh, i know of the event but i didn't know it was coming up um I believe that's a live stream where you can download an app to your phone. And if you have a cardboard VR viewer or something along those lines, you can participate in looking at things in 3D. I'm going from memory here, so I might be incorrect. But if you just do a search for Sci VR uh, on Facebook or on the web, I'm sure you'll be able to find what that's about. And I do remember previous events were very entertaining, especially if you've got kids. Um, we're getting quite a few people requesting objects to look at. Um, because yeah. it's midnight now, we've been going for two hours. We'll, we'll, this will be our last object for tonight, but we definitely want to do more of these in the future. So make sure you're following our Facebook page and you'll get notified when we go live. Um, better yet, join MBO. And when we uh, go back up to MBO in person for members nights, you'll be able to uh, come along and have a look through telescopes that see these things with your own eyes. And that is a beautiful spiral I can see right there, Adam. That's wonderful. Yeah. So this is the, the interesting thing about um, 
6907 is that this little smudge to the um, side of the eastern arm there, um, it's really interesting because that's actually another galaxy, 6908, which astronomers think is a, it's a lenticular galaxy that's been swallowed and consumed in a previous merger with with this, I would guess you would call it the, the host galaxy, yep. maybe. Um, and uh, so it's kind of fascinating. We're actually seeing two, two galaxies in one. Yeah, they're interacting with each other there. One's sort of gobbling yeah. up the other one. Um, I had a question. Can we confirm that we are looking at NGC 6907? Is that correct? That's it. That's the one. Uh, Kerry is already thanking us for uh, for tonight. So, uh, thank you very, very much for sharing such stunning views. You're welcome. We enjoy doing this. Yeah. Thanks for uh, for, for uh, sticking around with us for and being patient while we had the uh, bit of cloud at the start. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad we were so over. yeah, that I'm is probably a good time to, to sign off, I think. Yeah. Um, finishing off on the most distant object we've looked at tonight, 140 million light years away. Um, so tonight we've been enjoying the views from Adam's EV scope, digital telescope slash camera, which he's connecting to in his backyard through his phone and sharing that phone screen on the on the um, the computer on the, on the stream. Uh, in the future, we hope to uh, add my telescope to this so that we'll take turns between objects and look at different things. Um, throughout the year, there's different objects to look at. Um, after, or between the, the seasons of sort of summer and winter, um, that's when the Milky Way is visible. Between that is, uh, is a bit less to look at because we're looking out of the plane of the Milky Way. Um, but that means we get to see lots of galaxies. So... We're starting to come into galaxy season in the next couple of months, so hopefully we'll see some more of those in the near future. Um, again, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, MBO is a volunteer organisation. Uh, you've seen Adam and I here tonight, but there have been people behind the scenes who have helped make this possible, including Heike, Petra in the chat, um, and lots of other folks who um, contribute in all sorts of ways uh, through the outreach team, or even just as the members providing the membership fees to help us Keep going. Um, it's been a tough couple of years for us without being able to go up to the site. Um, we still have to pay rent. Uh, and so memberships have been a bit harder to come by because we can't go up there. So anyone who does become a member, you know that you are supporting a very passionate group of volunteers uh, helping us to bring science and our love of the night sky to the public. So it's not just money being spent and going into our pockets. It's, it's all going back into the society, paying the bills, keeping things going, uh, spreading the word of astronomy to everyone as much as possible. So please consider joining. Uh, you can do that at the link below. Thank you to you, Neil. Thanks for uh, for keeping me company and entertaining the folks. And um, My pleasure. Yeah, I can't wait to do it again. Um, and, yeah, I uh, hope, you, hope you enjoyed the, uh, the night and some of the objects we looked at. Um, it's obviously something new for us being able to have this sort of capability and, uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're really enjoying it and hopefully it's something we can, uh, bring more to, uh, to the folks. So yes, yeah. Thank, thanks to sorry. the team for helping us out. And um, I forgot to mention Stuart who of course provided his, uh, his expertise and further information on some of the stuff we were looking at. So thank you, Stuart. It's a massive team. It's yeah. It's not just Neil and myself. There's a, there's many many folks helping us out in the background. I think Saski was there for a little bit as well. So we really appreciate yes. them sticking around tonight. It's uh, it's it's a late one, and um, yeah, that's that's right. Bringing back a few memories of uh, being able to do deep sky at uh, Mount Burnett. So that's what I wanted tonight uh, to to bring back a little bit of nostalgia, and hopefully it's something we can do again soon. Yes, it's been great. Um, I love uh, to get in touch and answer questions with everyone as well. Um, we are passionate members, but uh, even those of you in the chat who aren't members and are sharing your enthusiasm for this, you're passionate as well, and I just love that. I really get uh, so much enjoyment from seeing that, that excitement and passion from folks. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, we hope to be back sometime soon, weather permitting, lockdowns permitting, all of that sort of stuff, um, but we will look forward to seeing you again soon. 
So uh, with that, we will leave you with our little uh, video clip. So have a good night. Stay safe. Uh, stay. Um, get vaccinated, please. <laughs> That's the only way we're going to get out of all this. And we'll see you soon. And get good up night. to the observatory. Yes. Yeah. If you're vaccinated, you can get to the observatory sooner. Yeah.